Okay, so good morning, everybody. Welcome to all students and welcome to all those students who are in our e-learning group as well. Um, we trust your learning. We trust that you are being encouraged as we learn, as we listen, as you're applying many things uh, as we learn in this very practical course of marriage, Christian marriage and family. Um, the last week, we started off with biblical foundations of parenting. We're going to be continuing um, that, uh, that entire unit to this week and into the next. We started on looking at um, uh, certain instructions, certain guidelines for us as parents. We, uh, we began, uh, maybe I think I'd just open it up quickly to somebody who'd like to give me a recap about what we uh, covered the last week on parenting. I know we did a portion, a part of um, the previous unit, but maybe just to um, start off with what we're doing today, would somebody like to quickly um, give us uh, a recap of what we handled last week? You could unmute and uh, share. Is everyone just still waking up from, still up from slumber? At least at this part of the world. Hello? Yes, Shay, go ahead. You seem to be the most awake, Shay. Please go ahead. Sorry, I thought I lost everybody. You want you want me to pray? Uh, no, I had I had asked for a recap of what we did last week. So a, a quick recap about what we had started off with the foundations of parenting. Uh, trying to recall. Sorry. <laughs> we did we did the parenting primer. And uh, we spoke about the uh, parenting being a divine calling, a ministry, something that God has ordained. Someone likes to take over from Shay? OK. I've never heard silence like this before. Uh, I think, okay, I think I remember <clears throat> something you said um, about the seasons of uh, children. Um, when they're toddlers, then they grow up to teenagers. You have to change your parents' style, the way you mm -hmm. approach um, discipline them. You gave example of your daughter, of how mm -hmm. There are things in her life, um, yeah, that you notice there are things that similarities between you and your daughter, and you give example on how um, um, we shouldn't just conclude and generalize kids all the same, but um, deal with them basically on their uniqueness and never just generalize them based on the status quo of how kids should ought, ought to be, but basically deal with them based on their unique, uh, the uniqueness, basically. Yes, I remember you gave an example of your son. Yeah, yes, I remember. Now it's coming to my mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> about your son, um, who um, normally he should actually be doing the things boys do, but he was more interested in arts and all the other things. So basically what you were buttressing down there was never generalize kids, your, our children basically, but deal with them based on their uniqueness and how they, uh, how they are formed basically. And then, yeah, I think that, that was one that stood out for me during the lesson. I, thank you. Thank you, Shay. Thank you. Uh, you know, it, uh, I think as Shay was talking, it just reminded me of how, you know, examples can really stick in your mind and, uh, that's what really helps to build certain concepts. So you just uh, you just confirmed that for me, Shay. Thank you. Yeah. So we did speak about how parenting in itself is 
um, a, a call. It's a ministry, something that God has ordained, an activity God has ordained. So if God instituted marriage, everything that happens um, in under that uh, that institution is also something that's divinely appointed by God, and so also is parenting. So we did we did even. Um, uh, Okay, thank you. Must see that. Okay, thank you, Christopher. Yeah. So uh, the we also did see that as a parent, um, we we are called to represent God, the Heavenly Father. Even though we are imperfect, we are flawed. Um, we are still learning, but we are yet called. Even all through all of that imperfection, we are called to represent God the Father. And our desire should be that our children will see God in us and through us, and that th through our example, they will have more of an accurate picture of God. We also spoke about how parents become, are, the, are the biggest role models. They are the greatest teachers for their children because children take pride in their parents and uh, they want to be like their parents. So we are in a position of influence. And as a result, we provide those opportunities for them so that we can, uh, the, the involvement we have in the lives of our children will be ongoing, will be godly. Um, and as we interact with them, we, we, are, we influence them through our words, our attitudes, our behaviors, our actions. And this influence is something that um, we need to continue on because children observe us. They, they see us uh, living more than, you know, a lot of things are caught more than it is taught. We, we spoke about that. And our influence is great. So also the same way we did talk about how uh, we deal with children differently, depending on how they are made. made. So we don't have a cookie cutter method for all of them. But, uh, you know, they, that they are uniquely made in the image of God. And, and thus we, we um, groom them, nurture them according to the way that they've been created. Okay, so taking on from there, uh, if you'd like to follow me in the book, uh, textbook, I am on page 158. All right, I'm on 158, uh, and we'll. I hope to cover this entire chapter here today. There is a lot of application questions that's there at the end of this chapter, and um, very practical and quite insightful in the way um, that that you can you and your spouse together can work together to bring up the children. So I encourage you. Um, you know, if you're married, you have children, please ensure to sit with your spouse and go through those application questions at the end of this chapter, which is on page um, 150, sorry, 150, uh, 168, okay, on page 168 and 169 are application questions. And um, if you can go through that, it will be very helpful for you to bring your children up um, with, with the suggestions and with, with what we have, the insights that we've learned from scripture. Okay, so today we're, we're going to go on. So some of the aspects that we are going to be looking at um, today in today's class with parenting is um, we're going to uh, have a look at uh, understanding children in the way that it is it is shown to us in scripture. We're also going to be focusing also on how, uh, just a little bit more on how we engage with children depending on their life stage or their developmental um, uh, stages, the kind of the place that they are in. And uh, then we will look into discipline because discipline is one of, you know, a big characteristic in, 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 in the way that we groom our children. Okay, so uh, so we're going to be looking at a few of this through through our uh, our class today. Okay, um, something that I missed out the last time to mention was that um, one of the responsibilities that as parents we do have is helping the children um, to teaching children how to live life. The the very 
um, you know, and, and I think right now in a lot of schools and institutions, there are uh, classes on life skills, okay, where they are taught life skills. Uh, and uh, I, I think I'm of the opinion that teaching children life skills cannot be done through a lesson or through, you know, paper pen activity, but actually uh, imparting that in within your home you know, in the daily living of your home. So these life skills are not just ways to live, you know, how is it that you manage yourself, but there are a lot of important, uh, um, many, many kind of principles follow, fall into these, this broad category of life skills. It's, it's skills that you pick up so that, you know, you can live life with wisdom and with understanding. And uh, as parents, we are called to teach them how to live so that they, they know it, you know, that the children are taught of the Lord. So you, you teach them certain things. And in this entire gamut of life skills, we are looking at probably daily disciplines, looking at how we can impart certain values or principles or uh, ways of living. Uh, and this is not something that's like a one-time lesson, but something that keeps happening. So it's progressive. It is ongoing. Some are picked up earlier on in life, maybe things that are more, more easily done up, like, um, you know, your thank yous and please and I'm sorry are something that you teach right from a basic age, from a really tiny age. But uh, as you, uh, but, but teaching values and principles is an, ongoing process and that's something that can be done through very many ways and not just um uh, you know not just being a formal training so uh, I, I think i just want to give you an example because uh, you know examples help mm, so i remember when when my kids were at uh, their montessori you know they'd go to school and they'd find a lot of things that are so colorful right so they would pick up uh, those crayons or things which may be an odd color, which, which probably they don't have at home. They pick it up and bring it home. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought that was an important time to teach them those lessons because it may be, uh, it may be very insignificant that they've bought back a chalk or a crayon, but for the fact that helping them understand that that does not belong to them and that needs to be returned and, and you know, not creating shame or creating uh, any kind of a negativity there, but just helping them see that what is not theirs is does not, they cannot bring it home, you know, and also, so you're instilling the understanding of respect and honesty and, um, uh, you know, even, even the fact that they, they will go back and accountability that whatever they've picked up, which is not theirs, will be given back to the teacher and with an apology. But, so these are also ways that, you know, you train even little young children for uh, in things of life. So as a parent, um, it is important for us to intentionally understand the values or the principles or the skills that you would like to impart to your children. Uh, because if we don't have, I mean, I always say this, if we don't know where we're going, we don't know our destination, we are going to go off course. So to to really know, okay, maybe I would like my children to learn respect. I would like my children to learn integrity. I would like my children to learn about time management. I would like my children to learn about compassion, about kindness, about generosity, whatever it may be. There may be a list that, that you may feel is important for you and maybe a list that your children do need. So taking that time to come up with those key values or those principles and finding out ways in how you would like to uh, impart those skills or those disciplines to your children. So take some time. And I think there is a, there is a, a a table, yeah. There's a table on page 158 that you know that you can that can actually help you to jot that down and uh, come to a place of figuring out how is it that you would want to impart these to them. Okay, so uh, uh, sit down and because, like we said, you know, it is important to have a roadmap. It is important to have a vision as to what you would want to impart to the children, and doing this could be extremely helpful. Okay. Um,
we move on to looking at what scripture says about about children and uh, i'm on page 158 if someone could uh, just quickly read up psalm 127 verses 3 and 5 3 to 5 and there's an analogy that is given here and we will just um, look at the way that uh, you know children are seen page. in the in the eyes of the lord page psalm 127 page 158 158 Page 158, yes. Okay, um, Psalm, Psalm 127, verse 3 to 5, it says, um, so Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. For like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Five, happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. All right. Thank you, Shay. Uh, Harrison, I shall address your question uh, at, at probably the end of the hour or in between. Right. I've, I've read it. Yeah. So when, when we look at the scripture, um, some of the highlights that this verse talks about is that children are a heritage from the Lord. They are given, they are an inheritance, they are a reward, that is, they are a gift. So the way that, the way God sees children is, um, you know, is it, he, children are serious business, okay? And they are not to be taken lightly. That, that is, this is something that the Lord himself gives. So the gifts of the Lord, you know, uh, um, a scripture says of how the father of life lights gives good gifts to his children, so ch uh, to his children. So children are a gift uh, of the Lord to us as, as parents. So when we look at um, children, as we had spoken about the last time, we see that every child um, born to us is unique and they're different, and they are made in the image of God, meant for God's purposes to be fulfilled, okay? So we don't see children, um, uh, you know, each child bears us an image, bears a certain, um, uh, uh, the, the name and, and, the, and, and a characteristic that God has for them. So when, you know, we don't, uh, sometimes we have this, um, uh, temptation to look at, especially when it's children, to look at all of them collectively, you know. But I think it would do parents good if we're wise enough to see them individually, just like the way God sees each one of us individually. Okay, so uh, wh how, whatever or the, the many number of children that we may have in our homes, the they are uniquely seen, and we see that the Bible has a very very a significant analogy that um, it brings about and he uh, the uh, the psalmist here likens children to arrows okay likened to arrows and um, if you know if I haven't done archery but uh, but you know you you see how people who um, uh, who do archery or you know who, who uh, sport who play the sport Something that they do is uh, arrows are, you know, you have to aim it to a certain target before it can be thrown. You just don't simply throw, uh, I mean, simply shoot out an arrow. You have to aim it somewhere. So uh, it says arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. So each arrow is something that requires to be aimed before that they before they can be released so this is helping us to see that every child needs to be trained and equipped before they can be released e equipped and trained into something that is that that god has put into them before they can be released okay it also talks of uh, you know arrows also are often used as weapons they're used uh, in war so that it can bring about victory. You know, you 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 ensure that you have victory. It's something that you use to bring about uh, uh, to to 
to bring victory in in a battle you you use an arrow and we see how it talks about that children themselves are those who can have a mighty influence and impact okay we see that in psalm 112 too it says the good man's children will be powerful in the land and his descendants will be blessed so they are the ones who need who as they being equipped and as they being taught they go out as influence they will become mighty on the earth so arrows are also seen as weapons that bring about impact and influence now arrows also um uh, are released you know it, it it depends on the pressure that you put i, I don't know if it's if it's called a pressure i think it's got this another name you know the how much of tension that you give it that the distance that it it travels so based on the tension that you put on it is is how much it's going to travel so it really talks about how much um as a parent you can you know you can help provide those opportunities help them uh, go into a place you know releasing them into whatever they can reach okay or what god has in store for them so it is a place where um, you know you you release help to release a lot more um, in their lives based on what you are sowing into their lives so the more opportunities you provide the, the the greater the atmosphere and the environment the greater is the you know is the distance they go for the 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 further that they accomplish in their lives okay and lastly script it talks about um verse 5 it says a quiver full of arrows mm, uh, happy is a man a quiver full of arrows specifically talks about you know how Uh, a quiver full of arrows is what brings about your protection and your defense and and that's what children become for parents you know godly children become for the family a sense of defense and protection so before setting them out uh, we are we are as parents to equip to prepare them for the impact that they could bring so and in order to do that we need to understand them we need to know them because you cannot randomly uh, equip them if you do not understand them and i and i think i brought about a lot of examples the last time so really knowing who they are and how do you know and understand them is one is when you actually spend time with them when you are listening and talking to them about their thoughts and their ideas um getting a picture of who they are as children what do they think how do they see things uh, really being able to engage with them to knowing uh, that th- there are many things inside of them and we are as parents and needed to explore that okay so we also need to not just uh, know them but also be in a place of observing them how do they how do they do things how do they interact what are their behaviors like what are their their um, mannerisms like because it it helps to to know our children a lot more so through these times as we engage with them we begin to understand them we begin to know them and then Uh, you know be able to guide and and release them into the potential that god has placed in placed in in their lives so through this god has yes put in good gifts into our children yet each of them are unique but we as parents before we help to release them we really need to know them understand them what they are like and god gives us the wisdom you know to see what may be important in their lives so that they could be released into that potential so let's look at at uh, uh you know taking that time to do that um of course requires uh um you know communication it requires time it requires attention so uh, doing that is is something that's quite important okay um moving on uh, uh something that we took over the last time is how do we engage with children the the um we we know that children grow up um and and go through very many different stages so if you look at you know the life cycle development of a child they start from being an infant to a toddler to a preschool child to a school going kid 
to a teenager and then to maybe an adult child. Okay, so that's the way that you see the transition of children. And each child passes through these different stages of growth and develop, development. But we, we uh, as parents, need to be able to engage with them differently depending on their life stage. Okay, you cannot deal with your teenager like how you deal with your toddler. Rather, you should not be dealing with your teenager like you would deal with your toddler, right? Because they are growing, they have um, their uh, needs in that age are very different from that of a toddler. So maybe a toddler is someone you would hold his hand as you're crossing the road. The teenager probably, you know, you give him the freedom to do that uh, on his own, right? So, so simple things like that. So the way that you engage with them are different. And it does parents-wise, if we are able to play these different engaging roles and being, being a little more wiser in the way that we engage with the children. So for an infant and a toddler, you need, you are playing uh, a, a role of being a caretaker where you're nurturing them and where you're caring for them. There's everything that's done for them. That's not the point of time where you discipline them. You know, you don't discipline an infant. Um, but then as they grow, maybe it, when it becomes, uh, they're a little more bigger is, is when discipline also begins. So uh, knowing when to do what is, is what wisdom is. The next stage of, let's say, a preschooler is where, uh, you know, uh, their life is all about exploring the world, knowing the world, um, finding out how the world works. So they require a playmate. They require someone who would guide them into, into showing them things. Like for a, for a preschooler, you wouldn't allow him to put his hand... Um, into a electric socket you wouldn't do that right you would you would either plug the socket in or uh, you know you would one give them some kind of a warning teaching them training them of how they need to be careful uh, for a for a child who's into a school going age that's where there's there is a lot more instructions that are given a lot more of discipline begins in a in a structured manner manner there and there is it, it becomes a lot more instructional in the way you participate with your child but when it comes to teen there is there is a lot it is a lot more participatory it's uh, we, we may not always be at a stage of being instructional. Yes, of course, there are some stages where you do, where you, where you may have to bring in instructions, and we will talk about that a little later. But the uh, parents need to be seen more as a teammate or someone who is um, encouraging, who is like a like a, a equipper, like a supporter, a guide who's showing the way way, but yet allowing the teen to find his own way through. With adults or young adult children, you, you become a lot more of a coach or a mentor or an advisor and uh, where you are sharing ideas and experiences. So the way that you engage with children uh, through the years from zero to let's say 21, there needs to be a transition. And the faster we learn some of that, I think uh, uh, there's less heartache for parents to be able to know that, you know, there are some things that you may need to step back on, some things you may need to step in and uh, uh, maneuver in such a way so that it helps the children to grow up. But also, you know, giving in your inputs in the way that is helpful for them at their uh, ages. So um, I, I think the the, the uh, challenge, especially in raising children, comes at a time when children move from the age group of being like like their tweens, that is the 10, 11, 12, into their teenage. That's where a lot of challenges um, come by with parents, right? And we see. Um, uh, struggles in that area. One of the biggest reasons for that is we see that as children uh, hit puberty, they are also um, building an identity of their own. Okay, they're becoming people of their own. They have their own thoughts. They have their own ideas, maybe their own opinions. They may begin to explore certain beliefs, um, have certain thoughts, and they begin to form all of this 
uh, you know, all what they have been trained in, what they're being, what they're seeing, they begin to form a personality, a person of themselves. And that becomes a struggle for parents because maybe the initial 10, 11 years, you're seeing a certain behavior and suddenly you're experiencing a transition. And that becomes a challenge for parents because um, often they, uh, you know, the parents do find it hard to, uh, to, let go to be able to you know uh, take off the reins a bit but it is needed for for children to go through that developmental stage it is needed for them to experience the world um, and you know come up with their beliefs but yet have a strong encourager a mentor or a coach in their parent to be able to help them navigate through the through through those difficult years so uh, if you look at a uh, page um 160 to 161 you will find certain practical um uh, you know, uh, ways of dealing with them. And I'm not going to go in through this, but you can actually take some time to just read through that table under uh, teenage transitions. You know, what what may be the teen, what is probably the teenager exhibiting uh, and what, what do parents perceive it as and how parents can actually see it differently. So if you can take some time to go through that, that will be that will be good. OK. We'll move into the section of uh, uh, discipline, uh, which is one huge area for for parents. Um, yeah, so one one big area for parents, and uh, uh, um, I, I think there needs to be due attention given to discipline because often. Uh, um, you know, parents make a lot of mistakes in the way that they discipline their children based out of what they would have seen as children um, in the way that they've been parented. So certain principles is what we, we will bring out today and um, uh, look at how best uh, you know, it can be applied as well. So when we look at scripture, um, discipline is something that we are called to do you know ephesians 6 4 says raise your children with discipline and instruction or um it, it, even in hebrews it talks about how the lord disciplines those he loves so that is a responsibility even for us as parents that to do is because we know that there is a need for discipline in any form of training whatever kind of training that you may be taking up whether it's training children or it's training an army there needs to be a discipline okay so discipline often is um seen as punishment okay but both of them are not the same the objective of discipline is to train is to build is to teach is to develop okay and it is not to bring about uh, pain or it is not to bring about punishment discipline should um, aim at correcting uh, uh, should aim at a self-correcting behavior discipline aims also at the heart of the behavior whereas punishment deals a lot with just the behavior um, for example you know let's say a child lies and punishment aims at maybe um, you know probably um, correcting the child through let's say uh, one or two wax okay and leaving it there discipline aims not just at correcting the behavior but looking into the heart of that matter what made the child lie what uh, you know what was within the depths of his heart that created that sense of a lie so that's what discipline the difference between discipline and punishment is so uh, and I think uh, uh, just to just to also bring about some kind of a context is that um, very often uh, you know families do feel that there should be a, an approach that is very strict, the kind of authoritarian approach that parents may bring about, where there is very strict discipline in in uh, correcting, but this often can be more damaging then it may be correcting because it it generally crushes the heart and the the spirit of the child okay so we may need to learn methods of discipline that are uh, healthy that that are also 
uh, caters to the to the child, caters to the to the age of the child, and also is relevant for them. Like for example, um, you may you know when you're disciplining a child, probably you may give a spank or two to a seven year old, but doing the same thing to a sixteen year old is uh, is not. A healthy thing to do because there are different instructional ways that you can deal with the child. You know, through a conversation, through through understanding, through through a talk, and so not so. So we understand that discipline can be should be catered to the to the child, to the age of the child, to the issue in itself, uh, and also to be able to help them to reach to the heart of the matter. So. Let's look at a couple of um, um, principles that we need to keep uh, in mind as we as we discipline. So the first uh, way um, or first principle that we keep in mind is to ensure that we keep discipline as positive as possible. Okay. So when we look at um, discipline, we. we we look at certain positive positive ways of disciplining and these forms of disciplining could would be in in the way that you help the children see what is right from wrong help them to um uh, you know, show them that there are consequences to those behaviors, to the things that they do. There are natural consequences that come about if they, uh, you know, if they fail to obey or if they fail to do something. There are there could be loss of certain privileges. There can be timeouts. There may be certain uh, restrictions that you may you may keep. There may be certain conditions if they are not met that something else seems delayed. So discipline, positive discipline. Or always is correctional and it, it is also a learning where you are not just modifying the child's behavior but also like I said looking into the heart of the matter okay whereas negative uh, forms of discipline could be um, uh, use ex excessive use um, of methods like shouting, screaming, uh, abusing, verbally insulting, um, putting them on a guilt trip, giving them emotional threats, making negative um, uh, declarations about them, putting them through uh, undue pressure. So you know even by the sound of it we we do see that these are not constructive in nature and we do and we we often see and i mean i'm also guilty of that is that often we fall into that um into this mode because we're not intentional about it and half the time you know especially when parents when they punish uh, they are actually bringing out their frustration and anger rather than or hoping to correct their child. So one of the biggest principles before disciplining is for the parent is to come to a place of calm yourself before you can dole out your discipline. Because your discipline should come from a calm understanding of the matter and uh, an understanding of correction rather than the need to vent out or bring out anger. So keeping discipline positive is um, the way to go because it helps for correctional behavior, self-correcting behavior, as well as for uh, it, it becomes a time of learning and a time of also examining the heart of the behavior. OK, so that's the first first point of keeping discipline positive. OK, I'm just going to uh, briefly stop here for any questions because I know this generally brings about a lot of questions. Any questions? OK, I fine. I, I don't think anyone has questions. OK, that's good. All right. So the set. Yes, yes, Charles, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> uh, about discipline and the I, I, I don't know whether we'll be able to handle that, but uh, I'm looking at being permissive and uh, especially with the current trend of of the world we are in, our our teenagers are accessing internet, uh, they, maybe they are studying, they are, 
chatting with fellow friends from Europe and America, and they are hearing that the way um, I, I, I will say this, uh, like the that Western world, their method uh, is, is totally, me I will say, to me as a person, like they are, they are not disciplining their children, they have left them. So how do you handle that when a child is in connection with people from the US, maybe from Sweden or German, and they, they are, you are trying to discipline them, you are following the techniques that we are learning, and the person is like, off. Oh, how do you handle that? Thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Charles. I, think, I mean, you, you've brought up a, a, a very important point. Um, that, that's something we will be also talking about, but then I think I will just address this here, is that, um, uh, so there are two things I want to say, and I want to connect it to what we're going to be teaching. So the first one is, when we are placing rules for our children, or we are placing instructions for our children, it should come um, what should come prior to giving rules is a relationship. Now, if parents do not build a relationship with their children in the initial years of their lives, I think it is um, very hard to expect the children will stand by your rules. So you think of this. Think of the time when you've probably been in school or, you know, some place where there's a teacher who's really connected with you. And when she brings about an instruction or she says, you know, there's a homework due for today or tomorrow, because of your relationship with that teacher, you will ensure um, to get it done. You will want to please your teacher. And I think it's the same principle that we see even in parenting is that when you build a relationship with the child and then you bring about rules, they are in a far more, uh, I'll say a fertile place to stand in obedience to those rules. You know, it's very hard for them to get off those boundaries because of the uh, just of the of the feeling that they don't want to uh, displease their mom or their dad. Okay, so if we are if we want our children to stand within those boundaries, the first thing that we need to do is build a strong relationship with with those children, because that is what really connects. Um, us into the level of speaking into their lives or uh, for them to embrace those rules that you have set for them because they will begin to see that that it is in their best interest that you are uh, you know giving pu putting in those rules so their obedience to those rules come as a as a result of of just wanting to please you okay and and look at it even in our relationship with god the more that we spend time with God, the more you want to please God. When you don't, or when you don't find that, uh, you know, you don't find uh, a strength in a relationship, it doesn't matter to you, right? So, so similarly. So I'd say the relationship is what really matters before you can bring out rules. The, the next thing we talk about is boundaries. So it, now, now this is in in the understanding that there is there is an established relationship that you are building and that's where you you know you you draw some of those boundaries and when we look at boundaries i'd say there are diff two kinds of boundaries there are some boundaries that stay constant there are some boundaries that become flexible okay so when when you look at boundaries that are constant there are some things that you do not uh, it, they don't change those that are they're not changing they're they're unchanging boundaries like for example you know honesty or respect or um, um, you know certain values that you have that's something that you will you you continue to to hold on to no matter what the age is or no matter what they are uh, what they may be 
uh, you know, even even if they've grown up, there are certain boundaries uh, uh, will not change depending even even if it depends on the certain conditions that they may be in. Like you know, simple things like 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 we said, you know, maybe uh, no stealing, no no abusing, no insulting, no um, no dishonesty, no lying. You know, all of that becomes firm. The ones that are flexible, the boundaries that are flexible, are those that that depend on. Uh, maybe their conditions, like sp specific, specifically, let's say for little children, you have certain boundaries, or maybe at the time that they go to sleep, or you know what they eat before going to bed, or uh, what kind of um, uh, maybe for teens, you know what are their curfew times, or um, you know the kind of um, maybe the friends that they go out with, or certain places that they go out with. So that becomes flexible because as they grow up, you know such boundaries can be maneuvered, can be shifted it can be changed and it is important to be uh, to to understand and and be explain these boundaries to them now coming back to your question uh, charles with with this with this big issue of of the internet and their studying that's there 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 needs to be boundaries that children um uh need to be aware of okay uh, Despite now in the last two years, I know it's become a huge challenge for all of us who've been parents to build into these boundaries because in some way or the other, there are certain loopholes that children find to do that. But I think that's where we not only monitor, but also, um, also make them accountable. So, uh, you know, so and, and I think it's perfectly OK in spelling out those boundaries. What are the number of hours that they could probably use the internet? What are the, some of the things that they can get, that they can engage in? Letting them know that there can be frequent checks on their phones or on their, uh, on their laptops. Uh, letting them know that, uh, you know, talking to them about the dangers of, of having such um, you know such an entire world of information right in front of them uh, you know ec um, educating them about things like um, pornography things like dating sites things um, you know strangers that that can that can lurk up on you it is important to get into a conversation and these are all part of teaching and discipline and boundaries and helping them see that you know these these things there are certain things that if they move into can be destructive. There are certain things that are constructive. And, you know, navigating that alongside with them. So there may not be a shortcut answer saying that, you know, you do this, 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 and it will all be well. It, it is not that way because they will be bound into temptation. But so tying into my earlier point of building a relationship, keeping communication open, actually helps to journey through these difficult points of time. Will they make mistakes? Yes, they will make mistakes. Will they fall? Yes, they will fall. Will they cheat and play an extra game or do something else? Yes, that will happen. But for us as parents to be intentional about uh, taking these instances, discussing about them, helping them through it is what we are called to do. All right. So it is a journey. It's not something you can do within a day or two. There may be many times you can discipline them before they they get it right. OK, like, for example, you know, we, we've kind of structured time for our kids on on when they can use the Internet. But there are times that it spills over. But I know I'm, I'm sometimes like these, um, you know, like these uh, uh, matrons that that is constantly keeping a watch, but yet trying to, you know, stay away. But it is important to go back and check with them. So I'm, I may not peer into what they're doing, but I will ask them, say, you know, what was your internet uh, day to day, or what? How much of time did you use? What did you use it for? And uh, there are times they've been honest. There are times that they've lied. I've caught them, caught that on them. We've spoken about it. So it is an up and down. But I believe it is a journey that that really helps us as parents to learn to deal with these issues as well as for children to want to come to a place of obedience and learning to please parents in, in things like this. Okay, I hope I answered your question, Charles. 
Okay, I have a question by Sam. Uh, shed some light on physical punishment for disciplining spare the rod. Okay, we have, I will talk about that. And I think it's there as part of the uh, thing. Um, I will talk about that, uh, Samuel. I'll just go back to uh, Harrison's question. He said, something struck my mind when you mentioned that parents are the greatest teachers, but I would love to ask what is your take on the trend in Europe where children are taken away from their parents all for the sake that the parents cannot take care of the child. Okay, um, so, uh, okay, now this I'm, I'm going to give you a personal take, all right? And I know it may be very different in different cultures, but uh, um, I think personally what I would say is the best place for children to be in is their homes till a point of time that they can be independent of themselves, okay? Parents not taking care of their child, I believe is not an option because they have been given to us as, um, like I said, as, as a loan and we've got to invest well into their lives, equip them well before they can step out on their own. So personally, my thoughts are that um, it is the parents' job, the responsibility, that's why they're given to us, to be able to nurture, equip, train, develop them to a point of independence so that they can work on their own. That's my personal take. And um, I do not subscribe to the fact that, you know, if parents cannot take care of their children, they're either given off to the grandparents or to foster homes or to hostels. I personally don't prescribe it. But I know that maybe situations are very different for different people. Like maybe, you know, in some homes, it's a single parent looking after four or five children, and it can be a difficulty. And so we need to empathize that they may not be in a state to do so. But if all is well, if parents are responsible enough, healthy enough, able enough, I think personally, it is something that we are called to do. It is a responsibility that we that is given to us. It is a ministry, like we said, it's a ministry, it's a calling, and we should be, we should have done the job as best as we can with, with the Lord as our support. So that's my take on that, Harrison. Okay. All right. So uh, shall we close for a break for 10 minutes and we will get back. We'll start with uh, talking about Sam's question and then we'll take it from there. Have a good break. <laughs> 